pray. You can sit still if you like in your seat, or you can stand up, or you can uh, get down on your knees. I don't care what you do, but uh, let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, giving you all the honor, giving you all this place in our hearts, Lord. Here's our heart. Fill it with your way, will, and want, desire, so that we can be what the Father would have us to be, be what the Son has paid the price for us to be, and be what the Holy Spirit empowers us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise as the Word of God becomes alive on the inside of us. And we thank you, Father, for mighty move of your Spirit in our hearts and our lives. Now, Lord, we're not going to just pray for ourselves. Mm -mm. We're going to pray for all our brothers and sisters that are other churches around the planet that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecost, Calvary Chapel's Harvest. We thank you, Father, for the Assemblies of God. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and our Adventist brothers and sisters, Pentecostal brothers and sisters. We bless them, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for all of the people that are out there today hearing the Word of God, cause the Word to become alive in their life like us, and we'll give you the praise. Also, Lord, we remember the persecuted church around the world, people that are being persecuted under pressure, hurt, and tormented at this very moment. Father, may the Spirit of God fall upon them and comfort them during this time, and God will also give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Now, nah, you're going to have to do better than that. We're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Yeah, come on, that's good, 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 good. Lessons from Joseph. I love this. Like I said, there's a lot of people talking about Mary. Not very many people talk about Joseph's life. We kind of read the story a little bit. We don't think much about what we're reading. We just see it as a story instead of something that God wants to share with us so that we can be all that God's called us to be by learning these things and these principles that are in the Word of God. Actually, I had about like 10 different, if you will, things that God sees in Joseph that made him so great. I'm only going to share four because I don't believe you could handle 10. <laughs> My mom used to say to me when she was in service, she would sit back there before she went on to be with the Lord. She says, you know, if you ever want to preach good, always preach short. I said, oh, mom, shut up. Come on. That's not what this is about. This is about getting the word of God into people's lives. But I also know how long you can pay attention. Let's take a look, if you will, and I'm going to read these verses. I'm going to read verse 18 through 25. As I read verses 18 through 25, just follow me in whatever device you might have, including your Bible, what a miracle that is, and let's go ahead and read together right along. Verse number 18 says this, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, after the mother Mary was betrothed to, to Joseph. Stop right there. The word betrothed, Pastor Dan gave it to you last week. It really means that they were married, but they hadn't lived together. They hadn't had the official ceremony. In the Jewish culture, well, when you got betrothed, that means that's the way it was. He was your husband. She was the wife. That's the way it's going to be. But they don't live together, and they don't have sex together, nor do they have children together until after the ceremony. So there's a period of time, but they're still considered at that point betrothed as Mary. Betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly, verse number 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid and take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is, she is conceived is in her is of the Holy Spirit, verse number 21. And she being bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he, was, he will save his people from their sins, verse 22. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled. All of this was done, in other words, that it might be fulfilled. 
In other words, hear what's being said and what's taking place because hundreds of years, thousands of years before it was prophesied. Watch this, man, and it's coming to pass exactly as God said it was coming to pass. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And Joseph being aroused from the sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took his, him his wife and did not know her. That means they didn't have any relationship sexually together. Did not know her until she had brought forth her first son and he, he called his name Jesus. Now, as a tradition, as my tradition, as I get in front of the word of God, is I like to take the word of God and I like to break it down so that you can easily understand it, so you can see it, so that you can see what's being done. God is saying something to you. God's saying something to me. Thank God he is. He's not just telling us a little lullaby story, but he's actually telling us something of great depth. So four things, if you will, lessons that we can learn today that'll help us be all that God's called us to be by listening to the word of God. Four things of lessons from Joseph. Number one, found in verse number 19, if you go to verse number 19, Joseph is a just man. You ought to circle it in your Bible. He is a just man. What does that mean? You know, a lot of times the language of the Bible is different than our language today. For an example, I don't go around saying this guy's a just guy, a guy, good guy. He's a just guy, and uh, she's a just woman. You know, we don't we don't we don't talk that language, so we don't really understand what the word just really is referring to. The word just means someone who is upright before God or a righteous person before the Lord. He is a just man. What does that mean? It means he's a man of integrity that God honored. He means he's a man of honesty. He means he's a man of mercy. He's a man of kindness and grace. He's a man that cares about other people. He is, if you will, when they use the word just, he's a no harm to somebody else guy. In other words, he doesn't want to hurt anybody at all. Do you know there's people that don't care if they hurt you or not as long as they're satisfied for themselves. So he is a very unselfish person. In the eyes of God, this is very important because you'll find that God wants to use people that are just or righteous. A lot of times we're stable, we, we stumble when we read those things because we look at it and we say, hey, here's Joseph. He's a just God, but I'm not there good for Joseph, but here I am today. I'm kind of one of those guys that makes mistakes. I use the wrong language at time. I, I don't do the real good things all the time. I, I'm just kind of frustrated with life and sometimes I express myself, you know, and I'm not really a very just just person. I really don't act like a just person. And we miss the point of how much just we have or how much righteousness we as the church really have. If you are saved, let me say it again. If you are saved, if you are born again, then you are in Jesus and you are just because you are in Jesus. Let me say it again. You are just, you are righteous before God. You are a righteous person because you are in Jesus Christ. And without understanding that, we oftentimes do fail. Let me just say this to you because it's important for you to hear. There are two positions of righteousness or a just man. When you get saved, you become a just man before God. Why? Because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. So when you screw up, guess what? God the Father sees Jesus, doesn't see what you did, and then you work at correcting it. That's called positional uh, righteousness. In position, you are in that position of righteousness because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when you get saved. But guess what? We still practice, so our practice is different than the position. Let me say it like this. So I may be righteous before God, but my practice is still very worldly. I still make wrong decisions. I still come up with a problem. I still express the natural way of doing things instead of the spiritual way of doing things. So my, because I'm in that position immediately when I get saved, doesn't mean I always act 
like I'm living out a Christian life. I sometimes act, and most of the time, a lot of times, act like the world. I am learning how to practice my position. Is anybody getting this? Let me say it again. I am, and that's what you're doing. That's what you're in church. You're learning how to practice my position. So we see people get saved. You ever see people get saved? Immediately people come up and put a big yoke on them. Oh, you shouldn't do that if you're saved. You're saved, you shouldn't do that. It's all a learning process of how to make the change until you get to where you need to be. Because this whole Bible, if you'll find out, is about Christian conduct in the epistles. And we're learning how to be what we are. What we are is righteous just in Christ Jesus. But listen to this. Can I just say this to you? We're learning. That's what we are. Now we're learning how to have Christian conduct in our practice. So I am already there, but I still act like the world. But God says he's going to give us time through grace to learn how to act like what we are. <laughs> is anybody listening? It's so good. So when someone comes along and says, Joseph is a just man, it doesn't fit me because I screw up all the time. I make mistakes. I, you know, I'm not really, I'm not there. Guess, can I tell you something? Give yourself a break. You are learning if you're coming to church on a regular basis, you're learning how to become and practice what your position is. And God, here's the beauty of it. God loves to use just people. He loves it when there's integrity and learning how to be unselfish and learning how to be a no harm, no hurt type person. He loves every bit of it. John, the 15th chapter, if you will, let's go there. In John, the 15th chapter, uh, just, if you will, pop it up for me. In John, the 15th chapter, verse number one, I am the true vine. Everybody say vine. vine. This is Jesus talking. He is the true what? Now, come on, five of you. He is the true what? Vine. He is, I didn't get all of you there. You gotta play with me today. In other words, you're gonna fall asleep here. He is the true what? Vine. Okay, watch this. And he says, my father in heaven, that's what he's talking about, is the vine dresser. He's the one that makes it all work. Verse number two comes along, listen to the word. It says, every branch, wait a minute, there's something new coming along. There's the vine and the fine dresser, but here's this word branch. Everybody say branch. branch. No, everybody say branch. Branch. It, branch is you. Branch is me. It branches us. And the branch is no good without being connected to the And the vine is connected to the Father. Are you following me? So he comes along, he makes a branch, and he says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. What does that mean? Every branch that is in the position of righteousness, but doesn't want to practice it, and wants to stay in the position of righteousness is in trouble. In other words, what's going to happen to him? He says, and he'll take him away. Don't want to go there. We're not those people. Because why? Because we have the position, the position as the branch in the vine. We are in Jesus. Jesus is in us. My goodness. And in that position, we want to learn how to practice our position. That's why you're in church. So you learn how to do this. Learn how to have that marriage. Learn how to run that business. Learn how to take care of your neighbors. Learn how to deal with a dog that just pooped on your front lawn. Learn how to deal with all those things. It's what life is all about. You're learning how the principle is called Christian conduct. So he says, every branch of me does not bear fruit. He's taken it away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. I hate those words. Have you ever gone along and you say, man, I'm going to church, I'm praying, I'm doing the right things, I'm seeing God, I've done the right thing, yet I'm being cut back. And you know, when you prune, that doesn't feel good. You just want to keep on keeping on. But he says he prunes. I couldn't get over this as a young man. Man, Debbie and I were in our young, we were preaching a gospel every single week. We were given our money, given everything we had to build a church, and this is a church we were at when we started before this church, and we, we were raising our kids and you know, half starving to death and didn't know how to do things, and then here comes the pruning, and we didn't understand that. Here comes the problems. 
Here comes the trials. We'd say, God, wait a minute. I'm preaching. I'm praying. I'm driving my kids to prayer meetings in the mornings and praying for an hour every day. And we're there and they're on the they're freezing on the floors and we're we're doing what we know to do. And here comes the problems and trials. What God was doing is pruning me. And if God can prune me, he's gonna prune you. And you're gonna be doing right, and God's gonna prune you. And guess what? He prunes you for a reason. Not just to hurt you. Look at what the verse says. And he prunes that you may bear more fruit. I don't know. You know, have you ever had a wild fruit tree? If you don't prune it, man, it's all over the place. The fruit becomes like mm, hardly at all. falls off. Tons of it is no good for eating anything. But the one that's pruned brings forth mm, good fruit. God knows how to talk to us, doesn't he? But then he comes along in verse number three, and he makes this statement. When we're talking about being in Christ and him and us. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. That is a powerful thing. In other words, the word that was spoken, they received it, and that cleansed them. And guys, it's the same thing today. When God speaks his word, that's why you gotta know the word of God, and you gotta learn the word of God. You gotta make time for God in your busy schedule. So why? So you can get the word of God, and when you get the word of God, it'll, it'll clean up your act. Is anybody listening? Anybody listen? But verse four comes along, and this is the verse I wanted to get to. I did all three just for fun. This is verse number four. Abide, the word abide. Everybody say abide. abide. Nah, come on, everybody say abide. abide. Abide means to live, stay, and dwell. In other words, I have to live, stay, because I can, you know, not stay, and I have to dwell, and means I'm, that's my life, in him. And he says, Abide in me, and then he says, I will live, stay, and uh, dwell in you. Can you imagine God making that kind of a statement? Ooh, that's good. So when I mess up, God's there to take care of me and put me back on track, and you will mess up. Yep. Has anybody messed up? Said, Don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> and he says these words. He says, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. I can't do that. You can't do it. You can't do it by yourself. The fruit you need to produce in your life is because you're hooked up to the vine. The vine is Jesus. Guess what? That's what makes you righteous in position and righteous in practice. Is that cool? And he comes along and he says, abides in the vine. But unless they abide in the vine, neither can you unless you stay in me, dwell in me, live in me. So cool. Is that okay? So when you come along, you read, say, oh, this guy's just, you know, David's just, or Paul's just, or Peter's just, and you know, these guys, Elijah's just, and Elisha, man, they're just, and Zechariah was just, and uh, Jeremiah was just, and well, okay, that's fine. Guess what, you're washed by the blood. You have, you're just also, you just don't have the practice down yet. Come on, somebody, you're so good. So God's not finished with you until you're finished with him. And you can finish with him anytime you want. Just say, I don't want any part of that. I think I'll just stay home and not do anything. But guess what? You're going to get pruned and you're going to be removed. You'll know them by their, oh, five people in the front row. Thank you, all you elders. Uh, you'll know them by their, what's Christian called, conduct is what it's called. It's powerful. Okay, let's go back to, to Matthew, the first chapter. Let's take a look. Number one is he was a just man. Number two is kind of fantastic. He's a courageous man. Here we find Joseph courageous. When God spoke this to me, I really had to dig and find, how do you find, how do you see that he's courageous? In verse, if you will, in verse number 18, I love verse 18. If I take you back to the First chapter of Matthew, verse number 18. Right at the end of the first chapter, it says this. And she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. I don't know this. I don't, I'm assuming this. I, I don't, it's not thus saith the Lord. It's not clear, but this is what I think. The word found means she didn't go sit him down and talk to him. Here's what happened. and I'm pregnant. The word found means it was discovered by him that she was pregnant, which really 
could have and did probably horribly frustrate him. In his mind, he's thinking, I know I haven't had sex with her. So here's my wife betrothed to me and she's pregnant by someone else. And in order for him to get past what that means, in a minute he has to, he's got to be incredibly courageous. There's, I mean, this doesn't mean anything to you, but I'll just share it anyway. There's a, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus that ran and wrote during the times of Jesus. After Jesus, Mary had proclaimed that she was having a child by the, and a birth by the Holy Spirit, Josephus writes that many women heard that and started proclaiming the same thing because it was a way out for them not to be stoned and killed for the disruption of their life and the sin of their life. And Joseph had all that in his mind. And also, if he doesn't put her away and change course, he's gonna have to take her as his wife and raise someone else's child. At this moment, he doesn't know yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't come and told him anything yet which means there's an embarrassment. All his friends, all of his buddies, all of his guys, men are men throughout history. And you'll find that all of his guys, all of his buddies are gonna come make fun of him. He married some woman, boy, what a sissy he is. He put up with that, boy, his, she really conned him. He's nothing, that's just a bastard child. That's it, nobody knows it yet. And he's just in that spot, if you will, of really having to make a statement and really going off of everything so that he can make that statement. He had to be a man of courage to face up to this. Very, very important for us to see. Also, what really shocked me was in verse, if you will, in verse number 20. Let's go to verse number 20. And right there you'll see in verse number 20 another thing that shows that he is courageous. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. How would you like to be abruptly awoken by something and standing in front of you is an angel of the Lord at night? You might think that's nothing, but I'm here to tell you that will scare your pajamas right back into the drawer. Are you hearing me? Some of you would have to take your pajamas and throw them in the washing machine afterwards. In other words, boy, heavens, I, this is a guy of courage. He's going to not freak out. Here's a little story I want to tell you. This kind of like telling on, Debbie hasn't even heard this at all. Um, I never told Debbie because I didn't want Debbie to think less of me as a man. And so she's in service. And I've had two services already that I was able to say this and she doesn't know anything. So I'm gonna say this, Debbie, and judge me as you will. <laughs> the other night, she's spending watching the children. So they're up, she's up at Dan and Jess's house watching their children and spending the night there babysitting. It's better that the children be in their bed than her being in hers. And I don't mind, because I'm preaching this week and I get to be alone, the house is really quiet. And uh, so I, anyway, so I, middle of the night, I fall asleep and, and I'm not gonna exaggerate this, I'm not gonna try to, I'll just tell you as it is, is that okay? I'll just tell you about courage, we're talking about courage. Fell asleep in the middle of the night, something hit me and sounded like a door slamming or something, bang! And it woke me up. You ever been woke up like that in a dream? Where something woke you up and you said, what's that? You know? Immediately I did what every man would do. I rolled over and said, Debbie, go see what that is. But she wasn't there. <laughs> I'm talking about courage now. <laughs> so she wasn't there. So I got up and I heard some more noises going on. I could hear people walking around. Now, let me tell you something. I have a concrete floor. 
you don't hear people walking around like squeak, squeak, squeak. That's a wood floor. It had to be in my mind or something. I don't know. But I hear them walking, talking. I hear everything going. I'm going down the hallway towards the family room. Actually a fact. I get halfway down and I see him. There's a man. And there's a little child with the man. Child looks back at the father or the man. Looks back at me. The man is looking at me. And I get the willies. I thought I would act different. I thought I would put out my chest, suck in my belly, and go after him. I didn't. My knees were knocking. I had goosebumps on top of goosebumps. I'm looking, and I stand there, and I say, and nothing's <laughs> coming out. My throat is tied up. We're talking about courage. I am such a wimp, it's unreal. And, and I went, <laughs> and then finally the words came, what do you want? You know, I've got to stop this guy. There's Debbie not to beat up. There's only me in the house. And I, he would just look at me, and I turn around, and I back up slowly, go back into my bedroom and do what any Christian godly man would do. I didn't get down on my knees. I didn't call upon the name of Jesus. I went and got my 38. Come on, somebody. In my house, I'll shoot you and pray for you later. Hopefully, you'll get healed. But you don't belong in my house at night. Got my 38, and there's, you know, not one time did I ever consult Jesus. Did I ever pray? I mean, I'm, I'm a mess, aren't I? And, 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 and so I got my gun in my hand. As soon as the gun was in my hand, I felt a whole lot better. So I started to walk out there again. Got about halfway down the hall, and I realized, man, I bet there they are. They're just standing there staring at me, looking at each other, looking back at me. I better turn the light on because I don't want to miss. <laughs> turn the light on, and it's one of Debbie's decorations <laughs> for Christmas. She, she, truly, she has these, the, the, these, these uh, what do they call those things, Debbie? What are those? What, nutcrackers. She has nutcrackers everywhere. Here's a little nutcracker. That was the boy. And next to the boy was, was the Christmas tree with a shadow on it. I almost shot a hole in the Christmas tree. I'm being really honest with you, boy. Courage is really something I thought I had and lacked. Now, I know in heaven there's a sign that says, warning angels, warning angels, warning angels, don't go to Pastor Jim's house at night. He will shoot you full of holes. But here's Joseph, one comes in and he's not surprised, he talks. I love the words, do not be afraid. You know why an angel is share, share, almost every time they show up, they say, don't be afraid. I know why now. <laughs> if the guy at the end of the hallway, the tree, yelled out at me, don't be afraid, that would have helped. <laughs> Joseph had amazing courage. I'm gonna take you, if I may, and tell you a story about King David. King David had everything you could ever imagine in his life. God had provided everything for him. Gave him everything, it was amazing. One day he's looking out and he sees a woman bathing. And he's like men. And he's checking her out too long. It's all right to see something, It's the problem comes when you check it out too long. You need to turn away. He doesn't. And he calls for her, and her name is Bathsheba, and her husband's name is Uriah. And he has an adulterous affair, King David does, with Bathsheba. The, the product of that adulterous affair was Solomon. And yet, he finds out she's pregnant, but her husband's not around because he's 
fighting for Israel on the front lines of Israel. He, David, starts to connive and get smart. He's not very courageous in facing his problems. And he starts to connive, so he says, I will call Uriah back. Surely he will sleep with his wife, and they will think it's his kid and not mine. Sad. All of a sudden, Uriah comes back, and he's a man of great integrity, and he will not go to his wife when the rest of his army is out fighting, so he sleeps on the steps of the house because he's a man that says, I'm not going to do that. He goes back and David now says, well, everybody's going to know. So I'll have him put in the front lines and then I want all of the leaders to back off of him and leave him up there by himself. David ends up murdering. Don't tell me God can't use you. David ends up murdering Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He takes her in and marries her but he's dead. Nobody knows what's going on. And then God sends to David when he's just doing everything, he's got everything, it's been wonderful, and God sends to David a prophet by the name of Nathan. Nathan tells David a story. He says, David, I want to tell you a story. It's about two men, one very rich with a lot of sheep and a lot of herds and one very poor that had one little sheep that he raised, that he loved, that he fed. The sheep was like a daughter to him. It was family. He just loved the sheep. If you ever raised a sheep, you know that they can get really close. He says he really loved this poor man, only this one sheep. The rich man had someone visiting him, so he wanted to cook a sheep that was wonderful for the person that was visiting him. Instead of going to his herds, he goes to the poor man and takes his sheep away, kills it, cooks it, and eats it. And the poor man is like brokenhearted and down and out. And David hears the story and he is so ticked off it's unbelievable. He says, that man, surely he will die, whoever that man is. And then Nathan says, in 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verse 7, I'll just put it on the overhead for you. He says these words, then Nathan said to David, you are the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. Go to the next one, if you will. I gave you the master's house and the master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that weren't enough, I would have given you so much more. But you took from someone else an adulterous relationship, and you killed her husband. So many times in church, we come to church, people say, I can never really do anything for God. I'm too bad. God doesn't look at your past. He just looks at what you're going to do in the future. Don't let your past stop you from the future. Let me say it again. Don't let your past stop you from the future. Let me say it again. Don't let your past stop you from the future. Because God can do anything. With all of us losers in the world, he takes and uses great way. In the bloodline of Jesus Christ, the Messiah is David, a murderer. And by the way, before David, his great grandmother, uh, uh, you'll find Rahab, who was a harlot. That means hooker. That means in San Bernardino language, ho. And God, in the bloodline of Jesus, it's not what you did in the past that counts, it's what you're gonna do in the future with God that counts. Now, here's my point, though. My thought, my, 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 my point is this. We're talking about courage. It takes more courage to face your problems. David repented. He paid dearly for the rest of his life for that mistake, but he repented, and he never did such a thing again. And sometimes courage is facing who you are, the quirks of your life that need to change, the things you never really dealt with, the things you know you're wrong about, and you work at making that change. We, the hardest thing in the world is you making the change, not for others, but for yourself. Come on, somebody. Anybody listening, we're talking about courage. 
The third thing I wanted to share with you from the life of Joseph that we can learn, lessons from Joseph number three, is I love this and it's really kind of fun. God's word supersedes all, that's it. Write it down. When you hear God's word, doesn't matter what you think, what you've calculated, what you've figured out, God's word has got to supersede all. Yeah. Number three, listen to these words. In verse number 19, I want to show you the life of Joseph. In verse 19, he says these words. Hey, Joseph, I was going to be an unjust man. One, and look at the word. He was, didn't want to make a public example. Was minded. In other words, he's thinking this out. Here's the process for every one of us that are human. We have a problem, we have a situation, we think it through. We gather data and we come to a conclusion. And then we act. When the conclusion oftentimes need to be superseded by what God wants, not what you think. Look at verse 20. First number 20 comes along and says this. But while he thought... See, we're all thinkers. And we do what our minds tell us and how we've calculated it all out. And we've figured it all out all along. But all of a sudden, instead of doing what you think all the time, you've got to do what God wants you to do. Something has got to supersede your thinking process. My thinking process, I'm mad at them. My thinking process, this is how we're going to deal with it. The thinking process, this is how we're going to respond. The thinking process is, this is the way I live my life. The thinking process, this, this, that. you got life all figured out. And then God comes along and says something different. And when the thinking process is superseded by God's word, that's what happened when God spoke to him. The Holy Spirit came to him at night and spoke to him to take, take her. And he said, I will. He put away his thoughts and took her. And thank God he did. Let me tell you something about this. I, I haven't really researched it too much. Just what I read. When God spoke to Joseph's family, which consisted of Joseph and Jesus and Mary at this particular time, he never spoke to Mary. He spoke to Joseph. Why? Because God respected him as the head of the house. And God spoke to him because he was a doer of the word of God. Didn't speak to Mary, spoke to Joseph. Take your family, Joseph, and go to Egypt. Now you're in Egypt, take your family, go back to Israel. He's speaking to him. Until the days when he's no longer in the picture, probably died. He's, God spoke to him for the family conditions. Interesting, isn't it? But here's his mind, and the word of God has to... Now, someone says, well, pastor, how do I do that? You've got to give God time to speak to you. You've got to hear this one more time, and uh, you've got to hear it. Is that okay? Yes. I, I'm, am I talking to myself? Is that okay? Yes. You've got to give God time to speak to you. You've got to give God time to do what he needs to do in changing your heart and your thoughts. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. There is a process I go through. About a year and a half ago, I started thinking about something. I brought it up to Debbie. She was against it. I started thinking about it. I never lost it, never could lose it. I tried to lose it, prayed about it, gave it to God, said, take it away. I don't want to think about it anymore. Uh, and and, and I, it was just something on the inside of me. It was just there. About six months ago, I started thinking about it more and then more. I said, God, this isn't going to work at all. Finally, in time, God spoke to my wife and said, it's just fine. And then we did that, which I had thought about a year and a half ago. In order to make sure that what I'm doing is God, you have to give God time. Why? Number one, God's not in a hurry. If God was in a hurry because of time, hear me, let me say it again. If God was in a hurry because of time, one more time, if God was in a hurry because of time, then time would be superior to God and control God. Are you following me? Nothing is superior and controls God. God controls the timing and timing does not control God. Does anybody listen? So it's, 
You say, well, I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to do it. No, you got to wait on God. Then when you do it, it'll be better than ever. Somebody ought to say amen to me. My goodness, it's so true. And what we have is a society that wants everything so fast. Remember the days you drive in here and you get a taco in 30 seconds. If you don't get 30 seconds out, you get your money back. Boy, those gave me heartburns. I don't know what was in them, man. There is some kind of stuff. I don't know what's in them, but I had heartburn. And here's the deal. It's not a time. We're always in a hurry. Got to have it now. Got to have it now. Got to have it now. Have it now. Your flesh, tell your flesh to shut up. You're going to give time to God. God's going to do something better than even you can think. Come on, somebody. In 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse number five, this wonderful verse comes up and then we're talking about that we gotta cast down those thinking ideas. It says, casting down arguments, talking about us, how to live a Christian conduct. Casting down arguments. One translation, the Old King James. Anybody got an Old King James Bible in here? Old King James. Raise your hand if you have an Old King James Bible. Okay, casting down, the word is imagination, right, Tammy? The word's imagination. What is imagination? It's what you're thinking. Get rid of what you're thinking he says, the arguments, and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You want to find out what God's word says. Listen to the knowledge of God. And bring every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. In other words, let's find out what Christ says. And now I'm starting to think what he says, not what I feel. So I have to cast down what I think to get God's thinking. Come on, somebody. Which brings us to number four about lessons from Joseph. And here's this, once you got on and realized that it's what God would have you to do, it takes great faith to operate in it. Faith. In other words, now I know what God is saying. Now I know what God would have me to do. Now I know how it works. Now I know where to go. Now I know how it uh, think. Now I know what to be. Now I know how to act. Guess what? Then you're going to just not know it. You're going to have to do it. And it takes great faith to get out and get the job done. That's what he does. He doesn't say to the angel, oh, I hear you. I'll do that and not do it. He does it. That takes great faith. Faith, the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, I hate this part, of things not seen. I mean, you don't need faith to believe for something you see. You need faith to believe for something you don't see. Is that right? And so all of a sudden, man, here we find great faith in Joseph like before. And that's why God respected him. And God spoke to him as the head of the house. Man, I'm telling you, God wants to do things, four things, lessons to all of us today that we can learn. Number one, we are just in Christ Jesus. As Joseph was a just man, so are we washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just need to stay there. Number two, he is courageous. In other words, it's going to take some guts on your part to do this that goes on. Number three, you're going to have to supersede your thinking, your process, your calculations, and the data you accumulate and do what God's word says over and above what you think or feel. Number four, it takes great faith to operate in it and that's what this is all about. This is a great man of God. His name was Joseph and so are you when you do it. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise today. 